all of this is wild. All, all the remains uh, pertain to wild animals. There's no sign of uh, domestic uh, herbivore. So then what does this tell us about the people at Gobekli Tepe? It implies that we are still dealing with hunter-gatherers at Gobekli Tepe. The entire area prior to the appearance of Gobekli Tepe is inhabited only by hunter-gatherers. There's no agriculture whatsoever. They haven't built anything ever. And then suddenly, without any background or any preparation, appears this huge megalithic site which is incredibly sophisticated. Turns out, at the same moment that Gobekli Tepe pops up, suddenly agriculture appears in that same region of Turkey. What we're looking at is a transfer of technology. This was the survivors of a lost civilization. They already knew how to create megaliths. They already knew how to do agriculture. They settled amongst a hunter-gatherer people who they may have reached out to before. They settled amongst them and they created this project. And this project was to restart their civilization. Are these aliens? Are they humans? No, they're human. Humans. They're human beings. The, the suggested dates that are coming out via astronomy is around 9400 uh, BC, which conforms absolutely perfectly with the carbon, radiocarbon evidence that's come out from stuff that they've removed from the actual walls which they believe was in situ from the time of construction. So we are here in a, in a very exposed uh, position on top of the mountain, uh, the highest place here in the region, so it was clear so they, they, they choose this place because of its uh, uh, visibility, the importance of, of the, the location. Yes, it was not hidden in some valley or in the plains, but it was on top of the, the highest mountain here, visible from all sides. We have this, this sense of, um, of a time capsule here. It's not been contaminated by later cultures. It was buried. Say again? Buried temples? Apparently so. These people went to great lengths to entomb these structures and by doing so created a hill of 300 meters in diameter, as seen in this photograph before the excavation began. Mind-boggling. At Göbekli Tepe, only six of a possible 20 temples have been unearthed as of today. The tip of the iceberg, one might say. Down below, another 14 are waiting to see the light. And they're all following one main uh, idea. The main idea is there are two very huge, two monumental pillars in the center of such an installation. There are enclosures and the enclosure walls are surrounding them and there are more pillars set in the enclosure wall. So we have uh, the appearance is more of a stone circle than of a building. And uh, it's uh, quite clear that the monumental stone circles had not been roofed. So there was no roof, there had been open air installations. These same era temples from 12,000 years back unearthed at Gobekli Tepe, show three different styles of form. They have been categorized as B, C and D, all with different patterns. For example, while the pillars at C form a spiral, the same at D have an elliptic pattern. There is also the fact that the surrounding pillars at said temples vary in number. The only similarity between the two are the facing twin T pillars at their respective centers. One might ask, what on earth do these T-shaped pillars depict? In the center of the whole story are the T-shapes, because we can understand the T-shape as a stylized human being. We can be sure because in some cases we have the arms and we have the fingers depicted. So we have a stylized human being, this is a, a, a T-shapes as human beings, and so we understand these stone circles as a gathering, as a meeting of such uh, stone beings. Two very important in the center, surrounded by other ones which are looking similar, which are uh, smaller, less in size. This first gathering that laid the foundation stone of uncharted human history apparently happened at Gobekli Tepe. 
then what are these pillars trying to tell us? So, and on these uh, sto stone beings, we have uh, very often carvings of animals or abstract symbols uh, in, in, in combinations, in scenes. So they are, sometimes they are really they are acting on this uh, pillar. So the idea is that we that these stone age stone beings are telling us, or, or the, the carvings are telling us stories about them. What what's, what's going on? They are telling us uh, moods of the of this, this time. At Gobekli Tepe, there is a symbolic statement passing us data from 12,000 years back. There is the depiction of abstract symbols, as well as vivid animal carvings of the fox, the boar, the crane, the snake, the spider, and the bull. The hieroglyphics of ancient Egypt, to our knowledge the birthplace of scripture, were also known as sacred signs and revolved around symbols. When we look up the word symbol from Old Greek symbolain, this is what we come across. In the broadest sense, a symbol is a device used as an identifying mark. A symbol is also the key to understand and recall the transcendental and timeless values it represents. But how does the human mind produce symbols? Sure, it's not writing in the sense of uh, uh, of science which uh, can be phonetically expressed. So, uh, true writing means we we can uh, we have uh, language. But here we have something different. We have uh, symbols which are um, expressing stories, maybe so not in connection with with language and not in connection with, with with phonetic terms, but ideas. They are expressing ideas. They are expressing stories. Symbolically speaking, among the unearthed portion, the most expressive and resourceful temple at Gobekli Tepe is currently the one marked D. Temple D is surrounded by 12 stylized humans in the form of T-shapes. The number 12 has a special place in mythology and the history of religion. We will look into that in a moment. But for now, let us look at a certain pillar called T number 33 and the symbols engraved on it. Pillar, we have a very, very interesting sequence of uh, motifs, which are here in a in a vertical row, which is much more than just decoration. And this uh, sequence of motifs, yeah, it's it's reminding us uh, maybe on, on Egyptian hieroglyphs. It's clear that we don't have writing here, but we have symbols which we can understand partially and partially not. We have here snakes, for example. It's clear, but here on symbol, it's an H-shaped sign. We don't know the uh, meaning of this symbol. This particular symbol appears on most of the T-shaped pillars, excavated up to now. In fact, it appears on almost every pillar at Temple D. And here an animal, an unusual animal for depictions, an insect-like animal with six legs and, and the body of an insect, very well uh, depicted. Again, three snakes here in the lower part, followed by a very small animal looking like a sheep or a goat. And again, an insect with many legs here with eight legs. Now here we had six legs with eight legs being a, clearly a spider. And this sequence is on both sides shows the heads of snakes, which we have here. But the body of this, bodies of the snakes are not on this face. They are at the other face of the pillar. So they are coming around the pillar and uh, giving here a frame to this uh, sequence of uh, motives. On the southeast face of this pillar, we see crane motifs, of which there are many more at Temple D as well as the other temples. The crane shows up as a significant symbol in many cultures. It represents the teachings of Hermes in ancient Egypt, appears in the traditional Kabuki Japanese dance drama, as well as in Australian Aboriginal dances. Were the T-shaped representations of humans at Gobekli Tebe the first ever god depictions in mythology? Resource literature claims that the Sumerians, as well as civilizations that followed, namely the Akkadians, Assyrians and the Babylonians, all show polytheistic character. There seems to be thousands of gods. However, when it comes to the pioneers of writing, the Sumerians, my own research begs to differ. The Sagbar tablet, written in both Sumer and Akkad languages, let's hear what it says. Incantation. Oath. 
insurmountable circle of oath. Insurmountable divine circle of oath. Heaven and earth's unaltered circle of oath. God is one and cannot be changed. God and man shall not be divided. Could the divine circle of oath be interpreted as the zodiac? The zodiac is considered the house of the 12 constellations astronomically and astrologically home of the 12 signs of the horoscope. The zodiacal signs uh, may not be exactly as they are today, but nevertheless the zodiacal signs were used at the dawn of civilization uh, which is described in the Vedas, the dawn of agriculture, because these were needed for the calendar, the 12 months of the year, the 12 adityas, as they are also called, the 12 pillars, as they have been described in later mythology. These are very, very old indeed. Was the heavens unaltered circle of oath, namely the zodiac constellations, known to humanity much earlier than the scientific estimates put forward today? Ancient wisdom as well as religion was on to the number 12 more often than not. The clock we use today is based on the number 12. The Chinese calendar evolves around 12 animals. The Hittites, who ruled in Anatolia 3,800 years ago, had 12 gods. 12 imams are the cornerstone of the Alevi faith. As per the Old Testament, the Israelites consisted of 12 tribes. And last but not least, Jesus surrounded himself with 12 apostles. With a 6,000 year head start, could ground zero for all these 12s be the 12 T-shaped pillars in Temple D at Gobekli Tepe? In this context, was Temple D the Earth's unaltered circle of oath in the Sumerian Sagbar text? At the center of this temple, on the front face of one of the symmetric T's facing west, namely pillar T number 31, we see the relief of a taurine head. The bull head relief is on front face, about chest high. The bull, or taurus, is also one of the 12 signs of the zodiac. One of the most significant cave paintings from circa 30,000 years back, interpreted as vivifications of hunting parties depicting taurine figures, can be found at the Altamira and Lascaux caverns. In many other cultures, we also come across similar taurine imagery. A wall painting at Chatalhoyuk in Anatolia, dating back 9,000 years, stands out from the rest. Portraying another hunting scene, this same theme the introduction of the taurine cult belief can also be seen at sacred grounds on houses within the settlement complex. Fast forward 3,000 years and the taurine symbol appears as a god in ancient Egypt as Hathor the cow or Apis the bull, both bearing similar significance. The sun imagery between the horns is called the royal crown. The prevailing symbol we come across when studying ancient Egyptian wall paintings and frescoes is the snake. Symbolized in a number of different categories with varying objectives, the snake is mostly seen on the foreheads of gods as well as pharaohs. Emerging from the forehead, also called the third eye, symbolizing higher consciousness, the snake is frequently associated with the god Ptah. While taking all of this into consideration, interpreting the snake imagery at Gobekli Tepe is somewhat complicated. Some of the T-shaped human depiction snakes face downward, others look just the opposite way. Perhaps one of the 12 pillars surrounding Temple D, namely pillar number 43, with a myriad of symbolic depictions, could be of assistance through some of its motifs. Right down there is the one that I featured last night with the, with the man bags on it and uh, the humanoid vulture. Unfortunately, the lower half of the stone has now been buried by the archaeologists, but you can see what it looks like because there's a full frame image of the stone on that board up there. 
the exposed part shows a bird carrying a sphere on its wings. Exactly beneath that, we see a scorpion. In this particular picture, there is the scorpion. There is also something that resembles a swan. Now we know that uh, the Milky Way, the whitish uh, river-like band of light in the sky, begins near Scorpius, the scorpion, the heavenly scorpion, and passes through the swan, Cygnus the swan. And that has been mentioned in Indian uh, literature as the goddess Saraswati or the river Saraswati riding a swan. In ancient um, Indian literature, uh, symbolically, uh, the sun is described as riding on a bird. Perhaps this uh, is a depiction of the bird carrying the sun with it. Numerous examples of the sun being represented as a winged disc were already found in Anatolia, Mesopotamia and ancient Egypt. What are the odds for the depictions on this pillar being the forefather of symbolic celestial expression? Quite high, one might say. Cosmic dust of the Milky Way, the Sun, Scorpio. But there are other striking symbols jumping out at us. For example, we haven't got a clue as to what these three signs above, resembling a basket or padlock, mean. On the other hand, the H-shaped, twice used, symbol to the right, we have seen before. The most fascinating image we have yet to come across, however, is down below. A decapitated human image with a bird portrayal next to it. A similar figure was found at Chatalhöyük, dating some 3,000 years after its first appearance at Göbekli Tepe. But the interesting part is that this figure was also associated with a bird, the same as at Göbekli Tepe. And it does not stop here. There is one other remarkable aspect. While all the figures on the pillars surrounding Temple D face inward towards the two T-shaped pillars at the center, only these two figures face outward. Would it be too far-fetched to interpret this as the immature human with no intellect succumbing to his most primal carnal urges? Let's move on and see whether the pillars of Gobekli Tepe exhibit other human imagery. Yes, we have several sculptures depicting humans, but in the reliefs we have only two until now. At first we thought the reliefs always are depicting animals. For, for some years this, uh, was this, this hypothesis was working. Animals or symbols. But since um, 2006 uh, we know there also can be included humans. And now in the enclosure F, which we discovered uh, last year, or excavated last year, again a human appeared. The most amazing of such sculptures, the Urfa sculpture, was found at the Yenimahale region of Urfa. Up to this day, this is the oldest human sculpture ever found. Let me draw your attention to the two stripes on the chest pointing downward. These wreaths are some ornament or some, some bracelet it's wearing. So we have a lot of beads in our findings, so bracelet. The hand position, it seems that he is holding its follow, so, but it's not completely clear. As we can see, the hand position on this particular one is not very clear. But, referring again to the hand position, how about the other, larger sculpture found at Gobekli Tepe? It has a, like this. Interesting, isn't it? At Gobekli Tepe, all the T-shaped pillars symbolizing human-like beings with hands and arms bear the same pattern in hand position as these later dated sculptures. On the other hand, there is no portrayal of the mouth, is there? There is no mouse, that's, that's true, that's a funny thing. In Gobekli Tepe we have a head, uh, also over life size, which clearly, or quite clearly had been part of such a statue. Again, no mouth. To comprehend something that was created by man 12,000 years ago is somehow tricky, especially if it has symbolic connotations. Let's take a look at Temple D again, which is surrounded by 12 T-shaped pillars, stylizing humans. 
One of the concentrical T-shaped pillars facing east exhibits two other symbols at chest level. One we have seen before, the ubiquitous H-shaped symbol. Maybe from looking at it too frequently, it started looking less and less of an H to me. The image I started to see, however, looked more like two T's holding hands. Just like this. Right below this H, there is the other symbol. A symbol I have come across during research. Could this be the forefather of ancient Egypt's royal crown symbol? What we have here is something akin to a solar disk crown, exclusive to gods and goddesses. Then what is this crescent underneath? The moon? The solar eclipse is one of the most dramatic natural occurrences humans experience. The first historical record of a solar eclipse goes back to 760 BC. King Barakib of ancient Syria made sure that this natural phenomenon was recorded by engraving it on a sculpture, later found in Zinjirli, Anatolia. Other such records are found on Assyrian and Babylonian reliefs. Once again, we cannot help but ask, has the Gobekli Tepe solar eclipse prototype been left as a message for the future? And as the sun and the moon embrace one another in the heavens, do the two T's, by holding hands, mimic the same on Earth? Funny story, this Tuku story, which is not so, so, so popular, but uh, I found this story in a book uh, about Sumerian gods and, and, and spirits. And uh, the, the Mount of Tuku was mentioned there, and the Anuna gods, as uh, anonymous gods without names. And on this mount, agriculture had been invented. In the cattle and grain text, this mound handed to agriculture and livestock farming as a gift from gods, is narrated as follows. In those days, Enki says to Enlil, Father Enlil, Lahar and Ashnan, they who have been created in the Duku, let us cause them to descend from the Duku. At the pure word of Enki and Enlil, Lahar and Ashnan descended from the Duku. For Lahar, they set up the sheepfold plants, herbs they present to him. For Ashnan they establish a house, plough and yoke they present to her. Lahar, standing in his sheepfold, a shepherd increasing the bounty of the sheepfold is he. Ashnan standing among the crops, a maid kindly and bountiful is she. Could it be possible that the temples of Gobekli Tepe are behind the legend of Lahar and Ashnan, which has its origins in Duku? Perhaps those which the Sumerians accepted as gods were basically humans at a higher level of consciousness, displaying alternate awareness, having already reached a more developed level of evolution. Commenting on what might have existed and occurred before Gobekli Tepe is as hard as predicting the aftermath. Let's look at this clay figurine, 40 centimeters in size, found at a Neolithic settlement site near Adiaman, which was built about 2,000 years after the temples were buried. This site is just 70 kilometers away from Gobekli Tepe. Could this small statue be a clue to the fact that the rituals have carried on? Perhaps we can draw the same conclusion from a clay vase found at Chatal Hayuk. On this vase, we see a human figure with a T-shaped head. Can we deduce from this that three millennia after the temples were buried at Gobekli Tepe, there were people still keeping the belief system alive? Paintings found on walls of a holy site at Latmos, dating to circa 4,000 years after Gobekli Tepe was erected, give us a similar impression. Could the humans depicted in these paintings actually be the gods at Gobekli Tepe? The most similar complex to Gobekli Tepe is without a doubt the one on the Spanish island of Menorca. Built 5,000 years after Gobekli Tepe, it is as close to Gobekli Tepe as it gets. Nevertheless, there are no depictions or symbols on any of the tea pillars at that site. Could this site at Toralba den Salot be interpreted as the living remnants of a belief system long lost? Why were the floors waterproof? 
What went on in there? Why were they buried a thousand years after construction? There are a lot of questions with no answers. As to who ran the show, undoubtedly they were the ones with a higher awareness. Worship was a crucial part of their existence.